Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. My guest today really needs no introduction in Hawaii. In fact, he's known across the nation thanks to Reason Magazine, which dubbed him the loneliest senator in America. Now, by no means was this man ever lonely. Uh, he was always surrounded by people and engaged with the wonderful people of Hawaii. But from 1996 to 2016, he graced the halls of the Hawaii State Senate, and finally, he became the sole Demo the sole Republican, excuse me, <laughs> member in a completely otherwise Democrat Senate. Then in November of 2016, the elections had it that our state Senate would become all one party, and that's a distinction we have, being the only single party house in the entire nation. We have Sam Sloan today to share some of his insights. I personally am grateful to this gentleman, considering him a mentor and a friend, uh, certainly an inspiring figure for many people, and definitely, regardless on uh, which side of the political spectrum you stand on, Sam Sloan has been and continues to be the most eloquent voice for a conservative perspective here in the state of Hawaii. Welcome to the program, Sam. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kaylee. Thank you for having me. Well, Pleasure to be with you again. It's good to see you, but since the election... It is, isn't yes, it? It is good to see indeed. me. I, <laughs> I look in the mirror every day and I say, gosh, it's good to see you. As yeah. you know, we've been called the bluest of blue states. We have a blue house, for a good blue reason. senate, who, a blue governorship, uh, the unions are blue, yes. the monopoly hold over most institutions is blue. Sam, what does that mean for the state of Hawaii now that we no longer have our loneliest senator as well, the sole Republican? First of all, I was never the loneliest senator. There you go. I knew why I was down at the state capitol. I knew who I represented. The 48 percent of the people who had voted for another candidate, another philosophy, and they were not being heard. That was my role, and I, I understood it. Uh, and we were very proactive rather than waiting for the, the Democrats to do things, as you know. But um, what it means to me is Hawaii is a monopoly state. And, you know, I came here right out of high school, right after statehood, 1960, the year after. And this was a very entrepreneurial place. That's right. But since that period of time, we've become monopolistic in, in almost everything that we do, education and, and taxes and, and politics and, and sociology. So my question would be, have we gotten better because we have one party rule? If so, why do we have the schools the same way that we do? Why do we have the roads the same way that we did? Why do we have health care the same way that it was? So Sam, why can't people afford to live here? Yes. So you link the decline in our economic status here in Hawaii, the quality of life and yes. so forth, to our being a one party state. Absolutely. Is that the same as our being a Democrat state? Would well, it be it, any different listen, if we were would it be any different if we were a one party Republican state? Probably not, quite frankly, because during territorial days Hawaii was a one-party Republican mm -hmm. state for almost 50 years. But now for more than 60 years, we've been a, a one-party Democrat state. Lord Acton was always right, you know. Uh, you knew him too? Uh, yeah, I was, <laughs> I was that old. So you know, power, power cor corrupts, absolute power corrupts, absolutely. If you don't have people, you know, looking at what you're doing, if you don't have an opposition, loyal opposition, raising issues and things like that, uh, then people are free to do what, what they want to do. What they've done is tax and spend and take us into debt. That's so you're, you're not saying we should be Republicans. No. You're, you're saying there should be a parity, a balance. Look, people in Hawaii vote for the individual, mm -hmm. generally, yes. anyway. And, and, you know, that, that parallels with most of, the, most of the country as well. But um, we should be more involved. When I came here, we were number one in the nation in voter turnout and very proud of it. And for the last five years, we've been number 50, bottom of the barrel. Now, do you think there's a, a link between our failure to have voter turnout and being a one-party state? Oh, absolutely. If, if the Republicans, for example, automatically don't challenge 25, 30 House seats, and you're in one of those districts, why are you going to go? I mean, it's like being in the Soviet Union or somewhere else. So there's no motivation to no uh, motivation. citizens then to get a lot out of there people, and vote. Yeah. And a lot of people really believe you can't fight City Hall, you can't beat them. And they look at the years and what's happened in things like the rail, the train to nowhere, and uh, they see that, that there's a lot of correctness. But I'm old school, Kaylee. I want people to get involved. I want them to vote. 
So, uh, yeah, that would be one thing that, that we need. There was a time when we had greater parity and much greater competition between the parties. Right. Since then, what has happened, tell me first, to the Democratic Party? What are your observations? Well, the, you know, we've had a lot of Republicans that switched and became Democrats. Mm -hmm. They were frustrated as Republicans. They were promised, if you become a Democrat, we'll give you a, a committee chair, we'll give you more money, we'll give you this, that, we'll pass your bills. They did it, and the Democrats kept their word. Meanwhile, Republicans kept shrinking from the issues at hand, and they didn't engage. They weren't the loyal opposition. Many of them who ran for office didn't even run as Republicans. They ran as bipartisan or, or centrist or, or something else. And so that damaged the brand of, of the Republican Party as well. So uh, as a party member, I, I take full responsibility. We we let a lot of this happen ourselves. We didn't engage, and, and that's where we didn't, didn't go after young people and, and tell them why it would be good to be a Republican. Since the 2016 election, yeah. we've even had national news media outlets describing Hawaii's Republican Party as dead, using yeah. that term. They've yeah. done post-mortem analysis all over the nation, political journals and so forth. Sure. What's your take? What is, well, the, what is the condition of the Republican Party here in Hawaii? Very sad. And, and, you know, down financially and, and membership-wise and everything else. But we have a, a new leader, Charlene Ostrov. Uh, many of us have a great deal of faith in her, but she's got a long road to hope. But she served in the, the military for a long period of time, and she has good leadership qualities. But the truth is... Um, words are great, but actions are better. So we'll see now, what regardless of uh, how qualified the party leadership is, yes. and, and you talk about uh, Colonel Ostroff, who has been a guest here, uh -huh. it boils down ultimately to having candidates who can win the public. Mm -hmm. What is the stable of candidates you know, for I, I the think Republicans right now? I think now? we've had good candidates mm -hmm. in the past. I think we have good candidates now. We certainly could use more and, and, and good recruiting. But they have to have... Uh, if you're going to have a party, if you're going to have a two-party system, you've got to have a party that is going to be out there in the public domain, is going to be engaging in issues and, and things like that, and, and the party hasn't done that. So for me, that's what I'm watching right now. Some of the brightest up-and-coming uh, politicians in the Republican Party have recently switched yes. in the House from being Republicans to de being Democrats, or at least one of them is applying to, to become a Democrat right now. Yeah, I think that's really funny. Beth Fukumoto you're talking speak. about. Right. And Aaron, before, uh, Le Johansson Lane yeah. before that. What is it going to take for someone to actually run and win and lead as a Republican here in the state of Hawaii, given the yeah. imbalance in terms of party? For them to stand for something, for them to be consistent, for them to have a message that resonates. I mean, there's a lot of things that, that are good issues that we talked about for 20, 25 years, but you can't do that. Times have changed. The electorate has changed. You have to find a way of reaching them and talking about things that are important to them. The millennials certainly have shown us it's all about them. They feel entitled. So you have to talk about those issues. Whether you agree or not, you can disagree, but you've got to have strong arguments for it. Well, what are the issues on which Republicans need to define themselves if they're going to be successful? And. Uh, it, clearly, we're not talking about the traditional issues that you've referred to, but issues that will reach the hearts and minds well, of the people. Well, some of the Hawaii. issues still are mm -hmm. traditional. The fact that people cannot afford housing in this state. Look, when I got here, they were talking about affordable housing. That's a joke. The we have affordable housing. It's $1.2 million for three-bedroom homes. Well, yeah, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I know. Unless you're in Kakako, then it's about 10, right? There you go. Um, you know, we've passed all kinds of phony legislation. Uh, to give breaks to developers if they will build affordable housing for a, a limited period of time. Um, we've had suggestions from developers and others what they can do and about zoning. It does come down to supply and demand, but there have been ideas out there. We're not willing to do it, and, and the reason we're not, the politicians are actually happy with the way things are. The developers are actually happy with the way things are. And unless you get the public that says, hey, you guys have been in control for all these years, and we've gotten worse and worse. We're going to make a change, and well, then they mean it. Nothing's going to happen. 
You know, your, your analysis is well studied, and you're an economist yourself. Yeah, uh, I, I and so you, you understand that the artificial scarcity we create with land and so forth keeps those who have the ownership in power. Right. And But what I hear you saying is that there are some issues that are tried and true that Republicans need to return to and present solutions on, such mm -hmm. as housing and cost of living. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, yeah, yes. and even medical. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday there was a, <laughs> a phony guerrilla theater uh, sit-in at the state capitol called we, a we die We had a couple dozen people there. Yeah, a couple dozen, and of course it was a top news story yesterday. R reacting to President day. Trump and the yeah, well, Republican these are, these administration's the same people. healthcare policy. These are the same people. You can see them at, at anti-Trump rallies having to do with immigration and having to do with health care and having to do with any issue that, that you pick. Because they, they pledged the day after the election, when they lost, that they were going to resist Trump. So where is the response from, as I say, the Republicans or, or from others? Because most of the things that they were protesting yesterday were false. They had not happened. They're not going to happen. As you know, the bill that was passed in the House on uh, the American Care Act goes to the Senate. It's not going to be in the, the same form that it was in the House. So what you're saying is that with regard to something like the American Health Care Act, yeah. Hawaii Republican leadership could have had an instant platform. Could have and should have. And, and yet they weren't there. No, but exactly. Why is that? I mean, th this is not like passing a piece you, of legislation. You'll have Th to this, ask them, this is David, you just should. making a statement. Yeah. A lot of people do not like controversy, and they do not like it when other people attack them or, or say, you know, you're racist or, or you don't like Muslims or, or you don't like the poor or, or whatever. They haven't learned how to answer that. They haven't learned how to stand up for those principles that made this country and this state Great. We've got one minute left before the break. Okay. What is one stereotype, false stereotype about Republicans you'd like to see dispelled? The party of the rich. Uh, if you talk to the I've seen your car, Sam. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> you've seen my car. You've seen my house. Uh, when I was in the Senate, I never took the perks uh, that were due uh, legislators and all that. Uh, we are working class people, and, and yet we've fallen for that. Lots of times when things are said about us, we don't answer it. I think that's a mistake. You All don't right. have to answer everything, but you have to answer those We're going to come questions. back right after a break. Promise? Yes. Okay. And when we come back after this break with Sam Sloan, I'm going to ask him about the Honolulu Rail. I'm going to ask him about the cost of living and housing and our economic decline in terms of uh, unfunded liabilities th that our state is facing. And he'll have answers for you. Don't go away. I'm Kili'i Akina with the Grassroot Institute. You're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. We'll be right back. This guy looked familiar. He calls himself the Ultra Fan, but that doesn't explain all this. Why? Why? He planned this party, planned the snacks, he even planned to coordinate colored shirts, but he didn't plan to have a good time. Go, 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 go. Now you wouldn't do this in your own house, so don't do it in your team's house. Know your limits and plan ahead so that everyone can have a good time. Aloha. I'm Kawi Lucas, host of Hawaii is My Mainland, every Friday at 3 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. We talk about things of interest to those of us who live here, and my past blogs can be found at kawilucas.com. Okay, I didn't look. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, Hawaii's leading digital media platform for civic engagement, raising public awareness on tech, energy, diversification, and globalism. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Welcome back from the break. You're watching a Hanakako here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina. At the Grassroot Institute, we like to say a Hanakako. That sounds like a venerable old saying in Hawaiian called a Pule Kako. Everyone here knows that means let's pray Kako together. But we like to say a hana kako as well, which is let's work together. Let's work together for a better economy, government, and society. Because think of the terrible alternative if we don't work together. And so much stands still because of that. Well, certainly th my guest today is someone who has demonstrated a willingness to work together. And I'll tell you something you may not realize. Many of his ideas and his proposals as a 
counter voice, countervailing voice Republican in the state Senate, ended up reaching the floor because other senators will put their names on it. He never wanted credit for that, but he's been at the forefront of advancing good policy. What I want to do is talk to Senator Sam Sloan a bit about what you think is going on with the Hawaii economy. Now, you've talked about there being a fiscal crisis, but to me, I just see a bunch of frogs in some warm water uh, on their way to the boiling point. Well, that's a good analogy, and, and you know that over the years, uh, when I was Senate Minority Leader, we offered an alternative to the state operating budget and the, the CIP budget. That's right. So the governor and the state would come out with their budget, and, and, you know, and your office would produce right. a, a and, and we would counter work with budget. Them. We would work with them because we wanted to make sure we were technically correct. We came to opposite directions. The state budget's gone like that. Our budget went like that. We showed how you can cut things, and you have to prioritize. See, when you're in the legislature, you're in a legislative body, it's really easy to spend other people's money and then take credit for it. Uh, several times during legislative sessions or, or committees, I said, look, if you really believe in this program, I want you to line up there against the wall, reach in your own pocket and pull out your own money and, and support it. And of course, they wouldn't do that. Now, what you've pointed out in your analysis is yep. not only are we spending money we don't have now, we spent money we didn't have in the past that exactly. we have to pay back, yep. and we're spending money already from the future before we have it. At a record and, clip. And this results in what we call unfunded liabilities. What is that? The well, unfunded the unfunded liabilities, liabilities uh, are basically the uh, state employees' retirement system and the state uh, employees' health system. Yes. Uh, together, they're over $20 billion, $20 billion. And we don't That's have money, money that's not that. there that should be there to pay our, our obligations. Exactly. To the state and employees. if anything happens to the ERS or the EUTF, the first charge is to the taxpayers of the state. It's like general obligation bonds. They come to us first, and people don't realize that. But yet, that, that, is, the, uh, you know, that is the reality. Now, I give credit to Governor Abercrombie and to Governor Ige. They both have tried to address the problem and put more money into trying to pay that down. But you can't do that while you're spending hundreds of millions of dollars more in, in new projects and, and new programs, or you're spending money for a, a health exchange that doesn't work, you're spending money for a train to nowhere, these kinds of things. So they haven't learned how to prioritize it. I'm old school, Kaylee. Uh, you know, I, I learned from my dad, you don't keep throwing good money after bad. If you see that you get no results, you stop it. You stop the hemorrhaging. And we haven't done that. Now, you talked about the train to, to nowhere. Oh, yes, the train to nowhere. <laughs> and and I, I don't take it from what I've heard you say that you, you have anything against uh, this mode of transportation per se, but uh, isn't this all about buying something we simply can't afford? Well, it's, it's several things. You know, we had the opportunity to use ne new technology. Instead, we chose the oldest technology there is, steel on steel. State of the art for the 19th century. <laughs> yeah. As, a, as an economist, back in 2005, I looked at the business plan, and I told the legislature, and I told the proponents, this is not going to work. It, it doesn't add up. Uh, we've been arguing for 15 years now, uh, or 13 years, about the cost of, uh, of construction. But we haven't talked about operating expenses, and we haven't talked about maintenance expenses. And as you know, any project, Construction is one thing, but the operation, the maintenance go on forever. Now, is it true, Sam, yeah. th that the original cost estimates that were given to the public, which added up to just under $3 billion, didn't even include all of the maintenance oh, and all no. of the operations you, and all you, of the other costs? You that are correct, sir. It was $3 billion, it was 34 miles, and included the University of Hawaii. Now we're at $10 billion, 20 miles, and we're talking about stopping at Middle Street. So it's kind of like going shopping for a new car, yeah. and the salesman in the showroom tells you one figure, but when you finally get your bill, yeah. it's exorbitantly well, higher. Well, you remember that scene in the in the car buying where the you've made the deal, everything is happening. He says, now I just got to go and, and get the approval from my manager. And he goes behind closed doors. I think they drink coffee and, and eat donuts, and then he comes back, and he says, oh, we can't do it at that price. Well, that's more honest than Hart has been in the rail folks because they have lied to the public. They've lied to the legislature. The mayor, I, I'm sad to see that the mayor has caught up with uh, President Trump in the poll, 32% approval rating. 
he has out and out lied to the public, and he keeps coming back and, and does it some more. But this time, this legislative session, people, particularly in the Senate, said no, no more. So I'm hoping, I'm one of those, I don't want a special session. I don't want them to, to mortgage more of my children's future. But um, we'll see what happens. There's a tremendous of political. Now, now we've it, it's not transportation. You know that. It's politics. Sure. We, we've been told that the cost the state needs to bear in order to complete the project is really minimal. It, it, yeah, it's just yeah. attacking on a, yeah. a small fraction of a percentage to our GE tax. Sure. And our GE tax is the tax that keeps on giving. Yeah. Uh, so we, what is so bad about that? Well, nothing's bad I, if I it true. But it's, it's not true. I think... Those legislators that agree with that and say that, um, they should be held accountable and, and sign a personal guarantee for any money that goes over that. They just haven't performed. They've ne mm -hmm. never been on budget. They've never been on schedule. Uh, they've had problems with the steel. They've had problems with the inserts. They've had problems with concrete. It's, it's just a bad project. And you're right. I'm not against mass transit or moving people, but you have to do it in a way that, that is efficient that's cost effective and works. This is now a development and investment project, not transportation, not even creating union jobs. Well, how does this boondoggle happen? I mean, we live in a state that has sunshine laws. <laughs> this is yeah. a democratic society. Yes. And it's right in front of us. We've it got happens. television, we've got the internet. How, how did the public let this happen? It happens when only 48% of the people vote. Mm -hmm. It happens when you have a one party state. It happens when a lot of people are benefiting from this. A lot of people have been paid off, PR people and, and some contractors and all that. As long as they are the recipients, they're not going to complain. Or if uh, Uncle Kaylee works for the state and Auntie Leilani works for the county, they're not going to say anything. And they don't. So there's a malaise amongst the people. We're, we're content with the way things are. Un unfortunately, yes. In, in other states and localities, we've had similar kinds of things, but at some point, the people grab the pitchforks and the brooms and the, the torches, and they go after them. Not here. Well, in, in some ways, there's no lack of money in Hawaii. We're a great place to park offshore dollars in high-end real estate, and all that real estate is protected by the mightiest military presence in, the, in yeah. the world. But when it comes to other kinds of dollars, to fund projects like a ferry system between the islands yeah. or technology or to take startups to the next level and so forth, People see projects fall apart, like, for example, the 30-meter telescope. Yes. What's going on here, and how is that affecting our reputation as a destination for capital? It's affecting it um, quite dramatically. Uh, as you know, we have capital flying, overflying Hawaii, eastbound and westbound. Shouldn't be. We're a state of the United States. We have a, a stable economy and a stable political system. We have a lot of resources. We have a lot of people that are very capable. But when you make a deal, when you sign a contract, and then you renege on it, as Hawaii has done in a number of, of projects, the latest being the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, that sends a message. Why do business with Hawaii? Now, with the 30-meter telescope, I, I think... Nine years were spent in the process of garnering every single permit, including a permit from the whole Office of Hawaiian Affairs saying it was culturally yes. sensitive. Yeah. Then it changed. Then all of a sudden the mountain became sacred. Uh, some activists, Native Hawaiians mm -hmm. and others, wanted to tear down the existing uh, telescopes that we had and yeah. not build this. And we competed for that TMT. It was a real feather in the cap of, of Hawaii that we won it because there were so many countries that wanted it. Now it looks like it's going to go to the Canary Islands. And so what does this say that... that it says you uh, can't uh, trust Hawaii. You can't do business with it's Hawaii. It's as if we're looking at Beijing in the 70s and 60s when exactly. foreign investment exactly. would have good, to be good scared. Good analogy again. And, you know, you said we, we have enough money or we don't have a shortage of money. We do, and particularly for those projects. And, and it's interesting. When we had Dan Inouye, Dan Inouye was the second uh, economic driver in the state. Well, that was an entire industry. He was. Man. He was. And, and if Dan said he was going to bring something in, he did. We don't have Dan Inouye. We don't have anybody like him. Well, let's switch to this topic. Okay. Uh, right now, uh, beyond being a Bernie Sanders state, yeah. we, we tend to have a lot of fun in the state attacking President Trump and yes. the Republican administration yes. nationally. Right. Yet, uh, it, it would seem to me that that would be a little counterintuitive to the fact that uh, 
in, uh, with respect to what Dan Inouye did, we also need to go to the federal government yes. for some cooperation. Yes, and Kaylee, that's going to be the savior of Hawaii. First of all, I still believe everything is cyclical. So as bad as things have been and all that, you know, the pendulum is going to swing back. It's just taking a, a time. But what's going to hasten that is the fact that we can't go to the federal government. I mean, we insult the president every day. We have lawsuits upon lawsuits and all of that. Uh, and then we go and say, we want you to continue funding the rail and this and that. Not going to happen. Not going to happen. What are your thoughts on uh, our attorney general suing the president of the United States over I wish the attorney general policy. would stick to Hawaiian affairs and mm -hmm. doing the things that the state Hawaiian uh, attorney general is supposed to do. Uh, we've had a long history of this. It makes for good headlines, and it makes for possibly future political gains, but it doesn't do the state any good. Now, what do you see in the fact that we have four staunchly Democrat yeah. members of Congress and the U.S. Senate? They don't have a seat at the table. Mm -hmm. They're totally out of touch. Uh, they don't have the, the uh, abilities that a Dan Inouye or even a Dan Akaka had. They knew how to get along. They knew how to uh, push when you had to push and, and work together. And you know, we're talking about working together. You know, when I came here right after statehood, um, everybody worked together and everybody was excited about new developments because we didn't have anything. You know, we were, we were a fast rising economy, but we didn't have anything. And so we developed all of these businesses and industries and we were excited about them. Now, we don't want anything. We don't want anything from the outside, particularly. It's not NIMBY, not in my backyard. It's we don't want them, period. We've only got a few moments, Sam, but uh, yeah. earlier I asked you for some advice to give to the Republicans. What advice would you give to the Democrats in order for them to succeed in making Hawaii a better place? Well, I think many of them think that they have succeeded. Mm -hmm. But as I say, if you look around at the cost of living and people leaving the state and the hardships that we have and homelessness, homelessness everywhere, then obviously they haven't succeeded. I think they've taken the public and the electorate for granted. Uh, I think they need to exert more leadership rather than political control and dominance. Uh, and we all need to sit down and, and talk together because the solutions are out there. There's not one problem that we can't solve. I'm very optimistic about that. Governor's race is coming up in 2018. Yeah. <laughs> If we pull ourselves out of partisanship, what would you tell people to look for in a candidate for governor? I would say instead of asking a candidate what high school he graduated from or who he's married to or seeing, ask him the hard questions. What are you going to do about our lack of uh, economic drive and, and homelessness and, and you know the, the medical problems and all of that and get specific answers? Uh, too often they get a political answer. You've got to hold politicians' feet to the fire. That's the first thing, because an informed electorate, a smart electorate, uh, will keep all politicians of all parties on their toes. Well, very good. Senator Sam Sloan, thank you for My being pleasure, with us Katie. today. My pleasure, Thanks Always again for inviting with me. You. My guest today, you just heard him live, Senator Sam Sloan, who for 20 years uh, held the post of being Hawaii's leading voice for conservative thought. He continues to speak out, and you heard it today on Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. Until next time we see each other, aloha.